Uh, so what I would, would like to do with the time we have together, and I'm assuming we have a, about an hour from, not a full hour now, 45 minutes at least, I'll, I'll aim for 45 minutes, is I'd like to do two things. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is give you a very brief, opinionated survey of several landmarks, or what I see as key landmarks, in Christian apologetics, that is, defenses of Christianity over the last 75 years. I suspect that um, many of you could guess what these landmarks are. So I want to talk about the landmarks of Christian apologetics and how we Christians think about apologetics and do apologetics. And then I want to suggest that it seems to me in the current environment, particularly res with respect to millennials, which is about 70% of y'all um, who are here, there are a couple of limitations of the traditional um, apologetics. And I want to talk about two limitations that I see in particular. <laughs> And there are a couple of things missing from the traditional apologetics from the perspective of millennials in particular, to some extent, our culture as a whole. It's particularly true of millennials, uh, but I think uh, our culture is in a different place than apologetics has been over the last 75 years. So the first half of what I have to say will be this, uh, this brief survey of, of several landmarks of Christian apologetics. And then the second half of what, I'll be, of what I have to say will be a discussion of this new book of mine called True Paradox and how I try to, I don't want to be too grandiose in what I say about the apologetics, but do something slightly different with the apologetics, to give a slightly different kind of defense of Christianity that I hope will respond, will, will respond to, uh, to some of the things it seems to me people are looking for as they're thinking about the nature of our world and what it means to be human that aren't fully addressed by traditional apologetics. So I'm just going to do those two things, um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions uh, for you all as well. And I may even give you an opportunity to ask questions of, uh, along the way or, or see if you're awake or do something to, um, to, uh, to take a pause, of my, a pause of my, um, my talking at you. <coughs> so to start with, the uh, traditional apologetics uh, or uh, landmarks of traditional Christian apologetics as I see it in the last 75 or 80 years there have been two major landmarks of Christian apologetics. And the first one would be the 1940s to the early 1950s. And uh, I'll start this as a question and ask, what, what would that book be? Mere Christianity. Um, probably, I would guess, at least half of you in this room have read Mere Christianity. If you haven't read it, I, I greatly commend it to you. I keep a copy of Mere Christianity on my desk when I'm writing. When I was writing True Paradox, I had tr uh, Mere Christianity on my desk open as I was writing. It was the most depressing thing I've ever done in my life. Um, because it is so beautifully written um, that you, you realize that whatever you're doing, it's not quite C.S. Lewis. Um, um, but I am going to say that there's a little bit, uh, I think there's some limitations to mere Christianity as a principal source of apologetics today. But just to, to, um, to refresh your recollection about mere Christianity if you've read it, and to, to say something about it if you haven't, uh, for my purposes, um, the key feature of mere Christianity is, is how Lewis goes about defending Christianity. And the way he goes about defending Christianity is he starts in the beginning by demonstrating that all of us have a sense of right and wrong. Um, that no matter who we are, no matter what we think we believe, there are some things we know to be right and some things we know to be wrong. And he, he uses some wonderful examples of about how children at an early age start talking about what is and isn't fair and what is and isn't, isn't wrong. So he starts there um, and he goes on from there to ask, where does that sense of wrong, right and wrong um, come from? Why do we have this sense of, of right and wrong? From there, he goes on to argue that it's located in, well, in God. Um, and he goes on to talk about Christ and our need for Christ because we know that we've broken the moral order um, of the universe. So he talks about Jesus, who Jesus is. 
Um, he gives the famous trilemma that Jesus um, must have either been crazy or evil or really was the son of God. He then talks about uh, Christian ethics, what Christian means in terms of a number of, of, um, of kinds of issues like marriage and divorce. And then he concludes with an overview of basic um, Christian um, theology. As I see it, what Lewis was trying to do in, um, in this book, and as many of you probably know, the book began as a series of wartime radio lectures. They were short lectures that Lewis gave during World War II that eventually got assembled into Mere Christianity and published in 1952. What he was doing in that book, as I see it, was he was trying to prod his listeners and then his readers, once it was a book, to more seriously consider the basis of their faith. Uh, so his readers tended to be people who were uh, thought of themselves as Christian. They thought of themselves typically as Protestant Christian. This was at the end of the period known as the Protestant consensus in American and in English um, life. And so he was prodding people to think more seriously about what they believed, and in particular to think more seriously about who Jesus was and why they need Jesus and why you can't be reconciled with God um, without Jesus. So in a sense, what his objective was in mere Christianity was to, to push their Christianity and water approach to their faith so that it became the wine of real Christianity, to, to get them to think seriously about exactly what they believe and why they believe it, um, and to locate that in the person and work of, of Jesus um, Christ. Um, for folks here who may be Catholic, um, you might be slightly offended that I start my survey of, of landmarks with C.S. Lewis. Um, a lot of people think of G.K. Chesterton, and particularly his book, um, Orthodoxy, um, as a key landmark, and I think it is in many respects. It also was very influential on C.S. Lewis. It had a, a profound effect on mere Christianity. Um, G.K. Chesterton is a little harder to pigeonhole, I think, but I would, I would put him in, uh, as part of the same kind of project, trying to prod people uh, who would have basically said they were Christian but hadn't thought about what they meant, what that meant, and as we would say now, had not taken ownership of their faith and not seriously um, wrestled with what its implications are, what its source is, um, and really what Jesus um, is, um, is all about. So jumping forward a little closer to my era, um, uh, this is slightly earlier than me, the 1960s, there was what I think of as another key development in uh, Christian apologetics. This one's a lot, um, uh, a lot less obvious. Most people think of C.S. Lewis when they think of uh, traditional American, or even though he wasn't American, uh, apologetics. Any guesses to who I'm thinking of from the 1960s? Francis Schaeffer, I heard it up there, um, and I won't say, I won't uh, uh, look closely enough to see whether it's somebody over or under the age of 35, um, a millennial or a non-millennial. Francis Schaeffer was a Presbyterian minister in the 1960s. He went over to Switzerland and started an organization called Labri, which means, I think, the shelter or something of, of that sort. There now are a number of Labris. The vision of Labrie was people could go there for a week or a month, help out with the chores, and wrestle with the big issues of life. And what was, um, what was distinctive about what Schaefer was doing was he, was he was started this ministry during the 1960s, during the, the period of student rebellion in the 1960s, and rather than simply dismissing the developments of the 1960s, as many Christians did at the time, he took them seriously. And he said, students are thinking about real issues, they have real concerns, um, and Christians should address them. At the time, many students, many the, the 1960s equivalent of millennials, were very attracted to existentialism, um, uh, to the work of people like John Paul Sartre and Albert uh, Camus. 
um, and to the ideas about authenticity uh, and the importance of the will um, in making uh, the decisions in our life. Schaefer engaged, uh, engaged that thinking in those people and that the argument that he made, or the apologetics he pushed, was an apologetics that tried to push people to recognize that there are really only two alternatives um, for anybody. One alternative is, uh, is to be a Christian, to recognize uh, the existence of God, which gives you an objective foundation, he argued, for right and wrong and for what you believe. If you don't believe in a theistic perspective on, uh, on the world in general, Christianity in particular, he argued, your only real alternative is despair. You have no objective foundation for what you believe, and so if you're honest with yourself, you, were dis you will despair. So Schaefer really pushed people to ask the question, what is the objective foundation for my sense of right and wrong, what I think is true and what is not true? And he said, you really only have two choices at the end of the day. If you're not deluding yourself, one choice is Christianity, the other is despair. He argued that the existentialists, for the most part, were honest about the stakes of that battle, although he also pointed out that when push came to shove, existentialists who claimed there was no objective foundation for, uh, for truth, there was no absolute truth, acted as if they really did believe there was some basis for truth. So John Paul Sartre famously, during the Algerian rebellion, uh, revolution against France, um, Sartre signed a manifesto in favor of the revolution, um, suggesting that he did believe there was a right and wrong, and that the revolution was right, and the opposition to it um, was wrong. So uh, Schaefer praised their, uh, the extent to which they confronted these issues. He, he quibbled with them when they claimed uh, that they had answered them without despair. Schaefer also looked through other, other phases of Western philosophy. He, lo he uh, looked through literature. He looked through art. And he praised the artists and the poets and the other writers who, to his view, were honest about the choices and recognized that your choice was either Christianity or despair. So he was a, Schaefer was a big fan of the British, the Irish poet Dylan Thomas, uh, because he thought Dylan Tom, Thomas was honest about the despair that his worldview um, implied. So that was Schaefer's perspective and, and his strategy on apologetics is really to push people to recognize that unless you accept the existence of God, you don't have an objective foundation for what you believe. More recently, someone who those of you who are under the age of 35 probably know, Tim Keller, um, who's probably the most prominent apologist right now. A number of you, I'm sure, have read his book, The Reason for God. Keller, in my view, is really using an updated Francis Schaeffer apologetic technique. He's really using the same kind of technique. It's brilliant. Um, Keller is a brilliant apologist. The strategy is updated for our contemporary world, so it's much more of a multicultural, pluralistic strategy. When Schaefer was writing and speaking, it still was realistic to assume that everybody is kind of white and Western, um, um, or that's overstating it a little bit, but uh, the world is a lot more multicultural, a lot more pluralistic than it was in Schaefer's time. Uh, Keller's apologetics reflects that, but the core move in Keller's apologetics in The Reason for God and Elsewhere is a very similar move. And the move is to push people to recognize that if you believe, if your perspective on the world is a non-Christian, non-theistic uh, perspective on the world, if you, if you have what I would call a science without God, perspective on the world, there's no reason for you to be able to trust what your mind is telling you. There's no reason to believe that our minds are, are rational and can be trusted. Anything that we say or think isn't trustworthy if it's simply a, the product of accidental um, evolution. Um, and this is an argument that when Keller makes it, he draws a lot on the Christian philosopher Alvin Plantinga, who makes a similar kind of argument that um, 
that uh, you, we can't trust our rational capacity if we believe that we're just an accidental product of evolution, evolution without um, God. Uh, Alvin Plantinga makes this kind of argument. Keller draws on it a lot. Um, the atheist um, ph uh, philosopher, NYU philosopher, Thomas Nagel makes a very similar argument. He made it in a book called Mind and Cosmos um, that came out a couple of years ago. Very good book, I think. Um, I don't agree with all of it, but, um, but a very good book. Similar kind of move. What it's saying is unless you believe in God, you don't have an objective foundation for what you believe. You can't trust that we are rational and that we know what's right. Um, in what is wrong. Brilliant apologetics, both of these books, both of these, or all of these, I've now named three uh, books and strategies. The Schaefer, the best known Schaefer book, is a book called The God Who Is There. Brilliant apologetics, very helpful still. I still give uh, uh, mere Christianity to a lot of people who, uh, who seem to be interested in, in um, at least thinking about Christianity. Lots to like in these, uh, these approaches. What's not to like about them? Or what are their limitations? So two limitations, it seems to me, um, for our current world. The first limitation, and the most obvious one, is we don't live in a Christian culture anymore. And so a strategy of prodding people to remember the things they learned in Sunday school and to take them more seriously and to think about them as adults is not a strategy that's likely to be effective with people who've never been to Sunday school. Um, and so we're just living in a different world um, than the world that C.S. Lewis was, um, was writing to. I, I feel like I should um, put my caveat on this once again. Your Christianity is brilliant. Every time, every, every moment when I was writing my book and I thought I had a really clever idea, and this happened a lot, I thought there's some really interesting ideas in here, it's in C.S. Lewis somewhere. Um, and so what I'm doing is reframing in many respects some kinds of arguments that he was, he was making, but he was writing to a different world um, than the world we live in. Second limitation, in my view, is that, and with apologies to you many, uh, many millennials, it's, I'm getting old, so I'm jealous of you, so I'm going to diss you just a tad. It's not really a diss. Um, if you talk to a millennial, um, or many other folks in our culture, and you prod them to see that on the one hand, they believe there is no truth, there's no absolute truth, there's no moral structure to the universe, they believe that on the one hand, but they also believe on the other hand that they know the difference between right and wrong, and some things are just wrong. Except sex trafficking is just wrong, they know it's wrong. You show them that that's kind of incoherent to think there's no truth, there's no objective standards, there's no moral order to the universe on the one hand, but I know what's true, and there is right and wrong, and some things are clearly right, and other things clearly wrong, if you prod um, many millennials to see that tension, their response is not, okay, tell me about Christianity. The response tends to be, so what? Uh, uh, millennials live in a complex world, um, and the idea that there might be a tension between uh, several things that we use that we hold really strongly does not disorient or disrupt or destabilize, destabilize the thinking of a millennial the way it does um, the thinking of somebody in my generation. Um, and so I think that's a significant limitation of the Schaefer and even to some extent the Keller um, strategy, although as I said, Keller is a brilliant apologist and, um, and his, his work is excellent. I do think it's a little bit of a limitation. Um, the two other things I want to say um, about um, kind of not so much limitations of, I guess in a way these are limitations of, of, uh, of the traditional strategies, is that they don't directly address things, uh, two things that I think a contemporary apologetics needs to address for, for many people. And the first is what I call the myth of scientific progress. And y'all all know this myth. The way it goes is 200 years ago, there were lots of things we didn't understand. God was the answer to um, how the universe came into being, how we came into being, why things look the way they do, lots of mysteries. Um, God was the default answer to those mysteries or explanation for those mysteries. 
says the scientific myth or the, the myth, the narrative of scientific progress. In the past 200 years, what were once mysteries are now things we understand. Science is on the way to explaining everything. That's the narrative of scientific progress. It is the, the primary narrative in your world, in my world, in much of this country, certainly the country of people um, who, uh, who spend time in college. Uh, this is the standard reigning narrative. An apologetic strategy that doesn't somehow engage that narrative directly, I think, is limited um, in some respects and cannot, um, and cannot, um, and cannot reach people. Uh, people will just shut off, um, shut off their mind uh, uh, and stop talking. The other limitation, or the other uh, thing that uh, contemporary apologetics, I think, needs to address is it needs to say something directly about social justice um, and about what justice looks like um, and how we should understand justice. Not that the old uh, approaches to apologetics ignore these issues, but I think it needs to be more direct, more front and center um, in the apologetics. Those are the kinds of things that I try to do in this new book of mine, uh, of, uh, True Paradoxes, is try to imagine a slightly different approach to these issues. Um, and everything that, almost everything that I've just said is not in the book itself. The book is sort of doing, or trying to do, um, what, I, what I've just been saying. So what is it that I try to do? And what is uh, the apologetics that I'm trying to encourage other people to at least think about? Well, I start the book, the motivation for the book is the very widespread perception that the complexity of the contemporary world is an embarrassment for Christianity. Um, that there's no way that a 2,000 year uh, old religion like Christianity can tell us anything interesting about a world as complex as we know our world to be. Um, and, that uh, subatomic physics has the kind of complexity we now understand it to have. Social life has the kind of complexity we know it. Uh, it we now know it to have. And uh, an illustration I use of this perception um, in my book is an email I got from an atheist friend of mine. He's a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania, where I am, um, in the medical school, who uh, was in conversation with me throughout the process of writing this book. He read an early draft of the book, and he said, I really like the book. There's some interesting ideas in it. Um, but here's what, um, here's what else he said in the email. He said, despite your arguments, Christianity um, still appears to me to be, quote, not much more than a human creation of Bronze Age peasants derived from wholly unexceptional and largely fictional narratives. Um, this is a friend of mine um, talking, about, um, talking about my faith. Um, that's a very widespread perception that Christianity is just not equal to the complexity of the contemporary world. My argument in the book is that this perception actually is exactly backwards and that if you look at some of the most puzzling dimensions of our experience as human beings um, and the things I talk about are consciousness, why do we have consciousness? Why do we have the ability to devise and debate uh, religion or theories about the universe? Why do we experience beauty the way we do? Why do we experience it as transcendent in some way? Why do we experience suffering as not just part of the natural order, but as somehow evil or somehow wrong or somehow reflecting a, a brokenness? Why do we long for justice and why does justice systematically fail? All of these issues, and at the end I talk about heaven and the afterlife, are is issues where it seems to me Christianity has really interesting ex uh, explanations. And surprisingly, the sophisticated view of the world, the science without God view, really doesn't have good explanations of these things. And so each of the major chapters of the book is about one of these puzzles and paradoxes. And maybe I'll talk about one. I really don't, I, I want y'all to have time to ask um, questions. So I don't want to fill up the entire time talk. But let me talk about consciousness um, and then maybe about beauty. Um, and then I'll either really quickly talk about the rest or, or stop and let you ask questions and get uh, into the rest uh, um, through your questions. So um, consciousness. Um, why do we have consciousness? That turns out to be a, an almost impossible question 
to answer from a science without God perspective, or what I call a materialist perspective um, in the book. Most materialists, people like Steven Pinker, the Harvard psychologist who's written a, a number of really interesting books, one of which I talk a lot about in my book, most materialists will, will, will uh, acknowledge that we do not have a good explanation for why we have consciousness. That if you imagine what early humans needed to survive, you can imagine needing some of the rudiments of consciousness, a little bit of language to coordinate, um, would be helpful, a little bit of a capacity to plan would be helpful. There's not a good explanation for why we have the brains we have that go way, way beyond um, that. Christianity actually has pretty interesting explanation for our, uh, uh, for our consciousness and our ration, the rationality of, of our minds, it seems to me. Christianity teaches that the universe is the creation of a rational God it is rationally intelligible. Psalm 19 begins with the famous um, line, the heavens declare the glory of God. So the, the universe reflects God in some way. So we had suge that suggests it's rationally intelligible. And we are made in the image of that God. So the, I, the, the fact that we have a rational capacity, and our rational capacity is trustworthy, is not especially surprising from a Christian point of view. And there's some really interesting evidence backing this up, I think, um, which I talk about in the chapter on consciousness. One of my favorite pieces of evidence is something, um, something that comes from a very famous article from 1960 or thereabouts, I think, by a, math, I think by a mathematician, called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. And what the article is about is how over and over throughout history, the rational abstract ideas of mathematicians that were devised to complete mathematical theorems that seem to be completely impractical, rational, but completely abstract, turn out to be necessary to understanding how the universe works. And I'll read um, uh, this last thing I'll read from the book. I'll read a couple paragraphs about this, because I really I love this piece of, um, of evidence. Um, so let me read a couple paragraphs about this article. One remarkable piece of evidence in support of the Christian belief, which is shared with Judaism and Islam, that our idea-making capacity is not accidental comes from the history of abstract math and a famous article called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. When math math mathematicians theorized about complex numbers, numbers that consist of a real number together with the square root of negative one, and I don't really understand what this means either, uh, but what the, but the mathematicians did, when they theorized um, about complex numbers, they were working with a purely invented concept. The article's author writes, and now I'm quoting from the article, most more advanced mathematical concepts, such as complex numbers, algebras, linear operators, Borel sets, were so devised that they are apt subjects on which the mathematician can demonstrate his ingenuity and sense of formal beauty. They might easily have been dismissed as intricate, or not, actually this is me talking now, they might easily have been dismissed as intricate, complex, and of no obvious use for human survival and flourishing. But complex numbers have subsequently pro proven indispensable to our understanding of quantum mechanics, the principles governing the physics of subatomic particles. This sequence has been repeatedly sufficiently often that it cannot easily be dismissed as the product of chance. Using their idea-making capacity at its most abstract, men and women devise and discover concepts that prove to be enormously useful. The seemingly irrelevant has transformative significance. Now this is something that from a science without God perspective is really, I think, almost unfathomable. The, the rationality of our mind and the fact that our rationality seems to be in tune somehow with the nature of the universe. Um, which um, a non-theistic explanation of who we are um, has a lot of difficulty explaining. 
I also suggest that there's another kind of evidence of the Christian explanation of who we are um, and how our minds work, a very, very different kind of evidence, and that is testimonies. Um, I make the argument in the book, and I really think it's right, uh, although this is a slightly pro provocative argument, I think, that if your understanding of how the universe works is accurate, if it is plausibly true, that understanding ought to help you better to lead your life. It ought to make you better able to, under to navigate the universe um, in some way. So that at churches, when we have what we call testimonies, people talk about how they came to believe in Christianity, how they came to accept their need for Christ, to reconcile them with God, and how that transformed their life. That doesn't prove Christianity is true, but it is a relevant piece of evidence. Um, and one of the things that's most striking to me about the popular atheists, um, people like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, is they seem to have intuited this point. So that if you look at what they're writing now, a lot of it is meant to show that a science without God perspective can give you consolation, can help you better navigate your life. Uh, that if you understand yourself as being part of the great web of existence, that will make it uh, more, uh, more easy, easier, um, to deal with the problems um, in your life. Um, and I don't think that lots of people are going to have that experience where their life is transformed by that perspective. But if they do, I think that's evidence of the truth of that perspective. Um, one of the things that makes Christianity so compelling is it's not just me, it's not just many of you who have had this experience. It's people in China. It's people in Africa where the church, the Christian church is growing more fa faster than anywhere else in the world. It's people in all places, all times, every culture that has not repressed Christianity has had people saying they were once blind what they now see. That they were, their life was in a gutter, but understanding that they can be reconciled to, to God through Jesus um, enabled them to deal with their problems. I think that's evidence of the truth of Christianity or the truth of any other perspective. Um, so maybe I should stop, I'll just say a word or two about um, beauty, um, and then I'll stop talking, and uh, if y'all don't have enough questions, I'll start talking again um, uh, with the time that I have. Um, so in the beauty chapter, I talk about the fact that each of us has had epiphanies of beauty. Uh, most of us have had them both in the face of a natural landscape that's really beautiful, and with respect to poetry or music or art of, of some kind. Why do we have that experience, that experience of transcendence that, that we associate with beauty? From a materialist perspective, it's really, really hard um, to understand. Some materialists would say that it's just an accident that we have this capacity to respond to beauty in this way. This is the way that Stephen Jay Gould, the Harvard <laughs> paleontologist who died a decade or so ago, that was his argument. His argument was, our sense of beauty is an evolutionary accident. Other materialists say there are evolutionary explanations. Uh, Stephen uh, Pinker says our response to a landscape appears to um, be triggered by being in the presence of the kind of landscape that where we would have been likely to be able to find food um, on the ancient savannah. So the idea is our sense of beauty in the natural world is a reflection of, um, of uh, where we're likely to find food, where a good place to live is likely to be. These explanations, they strike me as not really passing a straight face test, and I, I don't want to, to hammer that point too hard. I do think that evolutionary psychologists will come up with better explanations. I think there will be explanations for these things in time, but I think it's important to acknowledge there are not good explanations now, Christianity has a very good explanation for these experiences. The Bible tells us that we experience the transcendence of beauty because the universe was created beautiful, and it was intended to be beautiful. Why are our experiences temporary? Why are they often associated with a feeling of melancholy? Um, we have both this transcendence, but also this sense of impermanence. Christianity tells us it's because the world has been corrupted. Um, the world is fallen, and it is not the way it's meant to be. 
Christianity tells us these experiences aren't accidental, they're real, they're a reflection of what is true, of, true about the world. Um, so I, and I say a lot more about art. I also talk um, about justice and something I call the justice paradox and human rights and things of that sort and um, about heaven. And um, towards the end of the book, I ask the question whether there will be lawyers in heaven. Um, and um, being a lawyer, um, you, um, maybe you won't be surprised that my answer is yes, there will. Um, that there will be complexity in heaven. Um, and, uh, and if you can't imagine a sinless lawyer, um, keep thinking. It's possible, I think. So let me, let me stop talking with that. Let y'all ask questions. And like I said, if you don't have questions, I'm going to start talking again. So, so come up with some questions.